Hello, um, I'm Ann Tracy, and I'm here with the folks from LeSueur County, LeSueur County, um, and we're here to talk about broadband, and really, has broadband been a help or a hindrance when dealing with COVID? Um, and this will be a part of a series, I'm talking with a number of counties in Minnesota about it, and I want to thank you first, all of you, for, for being here. Um, I, I appreciate your time. And I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves. I'll kind of go one by one and, and maybe just start off by saying who you are, what you do, and, and just to answer the question, what has broadband been a help or a hindrance? And Robert, if I can start with you, because you're, you're sort of the ringleader, and I really appreciate all that you've done to get everybody in the, the Zoom room. And you're on mute. Um, Barbara Deere Klein, I live in Lesueur County and I have been working with the county on broadband issues since uh, February of 2018. And um, we have been working hard anyways to get broadband out more because it was such a desperate situation and now it is a compoundable uh, complicated situation with broadband in our area. And, and I want to add that being a bland and broadband community, start, we started, well, we've really been since May of 2018, we started working with Bill, we've been connecting together differently and looking at issues differently and um, really creating a great collaborative and then becoming a bland and broadband community and driving up to Grand Rapids and being in a room for the day and then never seeing each other again face to face was <laughs> great timing. But um, yes, there are many elements of broadband that are positives and are negatives. And we're still struggling with how to get people hooked up with another school year coming on board. And we're looking at spending a lot of time looking at our CARES Act dollars and what we can do to enhance our broadband, to, especially in the area of telemedicine and how we can network differently with people with disabilities and what we've traditionally done. We have people in group homes that have not left their group homes for six months, have no day activities. Um, so it's a crisis with huge opportunities. And we have the, the groundwork laid to use this as an opportunity as we move ahead for the long haul. That's my speech. Now, the, the people who are in, um, in, in the care facilities, are they able to get online at all? The ones who haven't been out for six months or? There's people with developmental disabilities for the most part. Some have been some are online and but we're looking at making some of that doing some of that connectivity differently but they don't they've lost their jobs like so many people but they are developmentally disabled and so there's worried about spreading contagion so they have been more isolated than your average unemployed person and yes we're looking at what opportunities we might have to to uh get them connected up differently great great barbara thank you thank you um, next, I think I'll go to Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon Frost, and I grew up in Lesueur, but I joined the Navy for 20 years and traveled the world and moved back, I think, like four years ago. Um, I got recruited to, to the committee to work with Barbara from my brother-in-law, and then, um, but I had experience working with Sibley County, and when they were going through their Blanding grant and doing some some education with individuals and businesses. Um, so I brought kind of what I learned um, from that to, to this committee. Um, I was explaining, well, updating Carl on some of my activities, but as a member of the VFW, we've, we've done Zoom with our meetings. Um, the demographic for the, the VFW members, you know, with the district is, is older. A lot of them don't feel comfortable going to the meetings and groups, so we're using Zoom. Um, and that's a, a challenge. It's It's been fun, you know, teaching them. But the thing I like to say is people don't know what they don't know. Um, so one of my, one of the members, we got them all set up with a Zoom account and we're on the phone and we go to test it. Well, it turns out he didn't have a camera and a microphone for his computer. So <laughs> I mean, it, it, the stuff makes me giggle, you know, but like just he didn't, he didn't know, you know, 
And, um, and then when he did borrow a laptop, it wasn't connected to the internet, you know, so it's, it, it's fun to see them trying how to, to use the technology and stuff, but, um, you just got to take, you know, baby steps with them. Um, we're going to try to do like a social hour with one of the members that's recuperating from a, a brain surgery and an assisted living. And I talked to, um, they're not in Lee Sewer County. I wish they were because, you know, maybe we could do some more help. But the activities director, she's like, I'm not very tech savvy, you know, so I'm having to learn a lot of the family members. They use the generic term FaceTime, which is just an iPhone um, term, you know, so it's it's learning for everyone. And and you can't assume that, you know, people know, you know, what you're you're talking about with stuff. Um, another member on on Google um, I was trying to get them to log into the district Google site I have and just terminal, out, you know, I'm like, well, is there a circle? He had a historical society from his wife account and I'm trying to get them to be able to log into the new one. And, you know, he's like, oh, the historical society logo, you know, so just realizing the, the terminology that, that other people are, are using and seeing um, as far as the connectivity I help admin the Elisa residence group for the city of Elisa or surrounding, you know, country people. And weekly there's a post about, you know, internet being down, especially Mediacom. They got the, the fast speeds, but it's just, it's not stable. Um, one of our teachers said she's had, you know, loss of connectivity three times in the last week. So um, that's going to be interesting when she's trying to teach and <laughs> not having the, the connectivity so um i think it's you know it's help and hindrance you know with with the covid that you know it's allowing people to do stuff that they never thought they could do um but if we don't have the connectivity that's the big hindrance when she's knowledge. when she's down how long is she down for does she i don't i guess i didn't see an update if it if it came back up usually they don't mentioned too much when it when it works it's only when it doesn't work no no but it was neat because I had posted when did Carl send out that speed test thing and then I eventually shared it and posted it on Facebook and um, in response to her two other people had shared that Facebook post saying do the statewide speed test so now I got other people advocating you know for that stuff and and it's not just me so that's kind of fun to to see it spread that everyone's realizing that that those tools will help and um, we'll see what happens. Good everybody. Now it's an interesting point as you said someone like media Cam, when you've got the when you've got the speed that you need but not the reliability you're almost in a worse position you know. Well, sure. My brother-in-law is her neighbor and last year they had CenturyLink but he had two you know, teenagers at home, both trying to get on Zoom. Well, the CenturyLink had, I think, three megabytes upload. So, you know, that wasn't strong enough to support two Zoom. So they switched to Mediacom. But then, you know, yeah, so it's a balance, you know, the stability work versus the speed. So that's I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> yeah, when you need a, re a redundant connection for your home, you're in trouble. And that gets crazy. That's, that's... Yeah. So. That's me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to, now I've got very much the Brady Bunch look and I'm going with King, Mr. King. Hi, I'm, I'm John King. I'm a Lisa Raconi commissioner and also a veterinarian and employee of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So, um, and I just started um, that position with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture the 1st of April in the middle of this pandemic. So I started out this new position working from home um, and it made me realize and appreciate um, the fact that I had um, broadband that was available that had enough speed that I was able to do it. I think during this COVID process, it made a lot of people realize that broadband and reliable internet isn't just something nice to have anymore. It's a necessity, especially with kids learning, um, uh, people working distantly, meetings from, 
from distance learning and that type of stuff. And, and it's gone from something that was really nice to have to it must be there, it must be present, just like electricity and sewer and water. And um, uh, I think it's lifted up uh, the awareness in a lot of people, many like Shannon said that, um, uh, that really had no need for it before, like some of the elder group of elderly people, you know, the veterans and that, they, they really had no need for it. But now that they're put in a position that they're limited as far as interaction and socializing, they realize, one, they need it, and two, that there needs to be better and more broad training and exposure so people feel comfortable using it when they have to. Um, also, during this time, the county has held all of their county commission meetings virtually, um, which is really important. The public has an opportunity to log in. Not that many have, but then not that many people showed up to our meetings when they were all in person anyway. So, um, uh, but there, there is, um, I think an increased, it lifted up the need and the awareness and people that maybe weren't necessarily um, advocates or even aware that there was um, uh, equity differences and access differences for different demographics of people now understand that uh, we need to make sure it's available, um, whether it's kids in the rural area that don't, that have really crappy internet access um, to um, uh, demographics that don't have um, what they feel is affordable or choose not to spend the money on internet connections. And I think that's really brought, lifted, lifted that whole situation up to others and increased awareness of the need for reliable, consistent, reliable, adequate internet access. Nice. Are you, are you getting calls as a commissioner, people asking you, we need more, actually getting more demand for it in that way? Well, and that, that's kind of how this all started with um, two years ago when Barbara found herself um, on the edge of where fiber was coming. She had, um, uh, uh, she had a, a wireless internet connection to a silo a mile or two down the road, which was inconsistent. And that's how we got started. There are people that are um, um, calling and mentioning we, we got to have internet. The frustrating thing to explain, especially in the rural areas, is that there's, it's it, to putting in, putting in fiber is not necessarily as logical of an exercise as what they think it should. They think it should just go right down this road and everything will be fine. But when you have, um, uh, when you have different internet providers with different business plans, you have um, the ability of incumbent providers to challenge putting in infrastructure, even though they have no real interest or intent to do anything in a timely fashion to remedy the problem. So it's, so it's not as logical as what people would want, uh, but it's, um, it's increasing awareness, especially in the rural areas. Um, most of the low hanging fruit in the areas that have had enough population have been served, but we have um, a large uh, square mile area within the within our county that doesn't have good coverage. Maybe not, it's probably 15% of the population of people in the county, but it's a large um, uh, geographical area that doesn't have reliable, consistent um, uh, internet access. Yeah. Well, and with 15% being in that area, you have to do things differently as a community. Well, and, and that's the thing. We, we you know, um, as far as financing it and the county taking a part in it, um, we've partnered with the townships because 
um, lack of access to reliable internet is mostly um, a township problem, a rural, uh, not a city. So we partnered with the township. So they have some skin in the game. They're contributing um, some, some of their funds towards um, building out infrastructure to provide internet for their constituents. Yeah, that's good. 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 Carl, can I ask you? Go next. Yeah, and thank you. I'm Carl Mink, Director of IT and Director of... Oh, you're on mute again. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, my name is Carl Mink. I'm the Director of IT and the Director of Facilities for Tri-City United Schools here in Lesur County. And I've been um, working with this wonderful group of people over the last year as we've come together to solve some of our, our broadband access issues. And Anne, specific to your question about you know, how COVID has really affected and impacted and also elevated the illustrated need for broadband in rural communities. Um, of course, March 1st, 13th, when shutdown occurred, uh, within 10 days, we had to have our students learning from home. And um, I know that Marlene can appreciate some of these comments as hard as uh, our teams and cohorts around the area have worked in their school districts uh, to provide that instruction and continuity of instruction through something that uh, really was um, unexpected by all, but also uh, exceptional in rural communities, right? So we had infrastructure and opportunities available to us uh, for things like Wi-Fi hotspots and things of that sort. Um, okay if you're within reach of a stick that is a provider, right? And, and, a, and a provisioning opportunity. And Dr. King made some very important uh, points in in his uh, answering of the questions in that um, broadband really is a utility. Um, and everywhere I, you know, I've gone, traveling out east and having family out there, uh, when you're in urban centers, it's a non-issue and it's not even on their radar screen. And as we come back to our rural areas, as also um, John had illustrated, uh, our communities really are, are very disaggregated and we have populations of two to 3,000 uh, in city centers with a large expansive area with a lot of things going on in between, even though it is rural. And being basically an agronomy, those con connections and market opportunities are really important to, to not only uh, the school district in reaching families and having that, that interoperability, but also to farmers, business owners, CSAs, uh, providers, daycare centers, you know, those things where the majority of our communications are online, aside of the exception of COVID, right? So um, it has been just a wonderful process and how COVID has also, I think, uh, impacted one element in elevating the need for broadband, Dan, is also the amazing people that I've met in the process, in these collaborative meetings, in these Zoom meetings. It has brought together uh, components of our community, our towns, our townships, our cities, and, uh, and, and all of the institutions that have this common need together to solve a problem. And the problem really is providing that equal and equitable access to broadband to our, our broader communities. So. Now, really, in the schools, how, how, how do you balance the fact that some, some kids have connectivity and and some don't, how, just on a practical basis, how do, how do you try to level that playing field for folks? And we attacked it in a couple different ways. Um, one was, first of all, reaching out directly to ISPs that were within reach if they didn't have knowledge of it. And uh, you know, we attacked each home situation differently depending upon what was available. Lastly, we looked at the highest priority and the most amount of need for connectivity in our most distant families uh, by providing them hotspots. Uh, we had a relationship with T-Mobile. We've ex extended that relationship to include some of the gaps for fall instruction as we're rolling uh, close to the start of the school year. Uh, in addition to at each of our uh, parking lot locations uh, for the three communities that TCU serves, we did a 360 degree uh, fixed wireless option for people to do at least pulling of content, uploading of content, 
um, okay. which was asynchronous learning, of course, but at least an opportunity for them to get connected if they couldn't have connection. So we had family vans and cars and vehicles and high school age students coming to uh, those Wi-Fi access points in our parking lots. Um, we also provisioned two mobile vans to be using this fall uh, so that we can go out to those areas of the community that are maybe underserved using a mobile hotspot and again a 360 degree fixed wireless antenna that, that goes outside of the school vans that are that our bus provider is, is allowing us to use for that purpose. So various modes depending upon what the actual need and location was and those uh, ISPs and providers that may be within reach of those individual family circumstances. That's a lot of coordinating. It was, yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, fortunately, our instructional leadership team and our administrative team um, really was in, engaged with one-to-one -one student, uh, student and family communications to, uh, to get on the front of the end of that early, knowing that we do have areas of the, of the uh, county and district where there are very big voids in access. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you for those. Yeah. those yeah. And I have to thank Bland and team too. Uh, Bill facilitated a couple of very important meetings uh, that had high level uh, technical content that was very informative. And I, I do appreciate that. And also the inclusion in those opportunities as they, as they come available in the future as well. Nice. So thanks, nice. Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Bill does a, an amazing job with that. He's very good with the communities. Good. And So oh, sorry, um, I'm Ann Traxler, Director of Emergency Management for Lesore County. Um, I'm originally a Duluth girl, but I moved to um, Lesore County 29 years ago. And um, being that I'm a Traxler, I, I kind of got brought into everyone right away. So I'm very lucky, I'm very lucky. Um, um, communication for me is everything, every event, communication is so important and I'm really grateful for the opportunity that the Blandon grant has given and I'm grateful that during the COVID crisis that we're having that we are looking at alternatives because I think in the long run there, there's something good that's coming out of this whole COVID and a lot of it is the communication and families and looking at our rural people that is so important. We're very lucky in Lissor County, we got great people. And um, the first responders give their heart every day besides all their time. And so I'm just thankful I get to be on this group and I'm thankful that we're looking, we're stretching out to everyone. And I think this is allowing us to look for everyone to have a bit of equality. Um, I live in La Center and I curse our internet and we have Mediacom and it's, is best we can get. But, you know, when everyone's on it after supper, it gets a little challenging some days. But um, the only way I've been able to communicate during COVID and not going places is through Zoom and the different um, technology. And it's amazing how you can keep track. And it's very nice to see a face, um, otherwise sitting in your office and it allows you to communicate. So. I'm just thankful to be a part of this team and um, I'm looking forward to what we can do. Good. That's good. Oh, sorry, that heard was, yeah. Thank you. So it's kind of, as you said, you yourself are having trouble in the center that, so it's the reliability. It sounds like the reliability yes. in your area is a bit, is as much an issue as is the connectivity itself, is the actual access. I think it is, I, the reliability, because yes, we end up spinning quite often. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, <laughs> no, it's it's better than it was. You know, you take it as it comes and at least we have it. Could be it's, worse. It's funny that bell-shaped curve really comes into its own when you've got talking about broadband, you know. It does. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ann. Susan, can I ask you to go next? You sure can. I thought this was a support group for lack of connectivity. <laughs> um, so the very beginning of our whole meeting, I had to reboot. I was in our county system 
clicked on the link through Citrix and then I told me I didn't have enough broadband and I needed to shut things down and so I had to re go into a, something different. I get my Wi-Fi off of a silo um, miles away and when it, and it's a thunderstorm. So I'm the same uh, silo I was on Sue, but I got off to give you more more speed. Thank you, Barbara. You've always had my back. All these. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm Susan Rinda. I'm the human services director, and I was just reflecting on 30 years ago, I had a, I, the advancement of technology. So it's a pleasure to be a part of this group, and it's a very exciting, it's a lot of work, and it's very exciting as to where we're going. 30 years ago, I was one of the lone um, on-call mental health staff. And I had a gigantic pager that only allowed me to go 30 miles from the sheriff's department to receive a signal. So I, there, were, there were times where I was one of few staff and I never got to leave my area. And now I really can't leave my area because of other things. And uh, so here we are 30 years from now. So um, technology, human services, big bucket of stuff, lots going on. Um, 61 staff, 74% are currently working from home who never worked from, many have never worked from home. Uh, so our technology staff at the county have been amazing in getting us ramped up to work from home with devices. But one of the things that is always lacking, I think Shannon spoke of training, I kind of came on uh, at the tail end of hers, but just we, we got a lot of people out there without very little training. And so we've uh, spent a lot of time in just, you know, the basics with things and look at Zoom and Citrix and I have video, go to meeting, uh, all those kinds of things, all this uh, various platforms. And I found that, you know, really none, none of them is really perfect without great connectivity. So this is wonderful to be a part of this group. The populations we serve are very vulnerable. Um, COVID has taken a hit on so many of our local businesses and our providers. We have lost a few providers uh, this year. We're starting to gain back a few through creativity and, and that's what COVID has done to us has caused us to have to really think out of the box and be creative and like Ann and Carl and Commissioner King, many have said is that we are so fortunate to have a great network of people to work with who have all kinds of backgrounds and strengths and some strengths that we didn't even know they had and we needed them during this time. So there's been many positives, but without communication and connectivity, um, you really can't get a lot of great things done. And we are a people business. We need to see people face to face. We need them to know we are checking in and we care about them and that's really challenged us. Um, half of our staff are absolutely loving this because um, they can be more productive. Um, we have a cubicle farm at work and they're on top of one another and it had become a call center uh, with regard to METS and with our Minsure and um, healthcare programs. So now they're working from home, having more privacy and less distractions and we are actually um, improving productivity. Our other half of our staff, we see people to face our clubhouses, our outreach, are struggling, not doing as well, and finding desperate ways to meet with people face to face and not through technology. But the technology has been um, great to be able to use as a backup. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Uh, we just really, you know, it has allowed us to be more interactive in many ways. Um, I'm really excited about, um, Shannon was talking about the training, I'm really excited about our opportunities through the CARES Act. It was going to be blended, but since we might be pushing this down the road a little bit with a, a bundle. So helping our, uh, the public and people we serve with a device and access and training. Those three pieces are so important for success during this time and, and kind of propping people up and keeping them together. We've rolled out a lot of mental health services that are no better time than now I've said. We have all of these resources and they are available through technology, but without the ability to access them or the comfortability in using them and the training to be able to feel like it is private. I mean, privacy in homes, 
um, even our staff, you know, that you just can't work from a kitchen table in the middle of everybody. You're, you're dealing with confidential information and we have to really make sure we're tending to people's privacy and confidential in their homes, which is really a, a challenge too. So really excited to be a part of this. And um, there is a lot going on. You know, we're looking at expanding. I think Marlene was on for a little bit here too through the schools, uh, School Link Mental Health. And some of those just had a meeting yesterday um, with regard to the school link mental health staff being able to ramp up additional trainings for staff and doing some online video uh, technology and training uh, for students as well as, as staff. So nice, nice. Yeah. Now, with the direct services that you provide, are you've alluded to it a little bit, but what do you have an idea of what the percentage are who are happy? With doing the online service, you know, having online service versus in person, how are they dealing with it? Are they prepared? Yeah, well, uh, you know, in our financial area, because of the waivers that we've gotten from the state and federal government, um, our financial group is very happy. The consumers that are accessing us, there's a, I do not get any complaints um at all and and staff have been relatively happy with all that would love to keep the thing we've learned is what would we like to keep going forward and um having these waivers uh we're trying to track all of that and advocate at the legislature with regard to there are a lot of things that we've had to do and for good reason and they should stay they they are very effective for people um with regard to our social services side of things um our mental, our adult mental health population is, I would say, low. Low uh, um, are not really happy with. Uh, they're huh. very, they're very sad, and they want their um, groups um, and their clubhouse activities. So we have been creative with that. We've been going community, community, outdoors, having clubs. We can't bring them into a confined space that we've had. So a little bit lower on the. Um, I'm pleased to be participating in this with people who have a tendency to isolate anyway and needed that human connection. But those that are, you know, tech savvy and also don't want to see us, you know, very much because there's people, you know, there's been less kind of accountability from uh, signatures and, um, you know, it's gone to more verbal and technology. And we find we have a lot of introverted people out there and introverts have really thrived through this and our extroverts are have struggled. <laughs> so Zoom has been wonderful because you talked about the Brady Bunch. You can really, um, you can see people and you can share and you can be very interactive. And it is training. Training is the key. That's the gateway to getting our people who would rate this low as not wanting to be a part of this to getting them moving the needle on that a little bit. And we're making, we're making inroads in that, but it's going to take time. And we tell people, please be patient with us. We'll be patient with you and we'll keep working through the bugs because, um, you know, it's, we're in uncharted territory with a lot of this. So, but waivers have been wonderful to be able to, to have more flexibility and freedom to serve people in different ways. That's hopefully I answered your question. Yeah. Well, this, the, the thought that introverts have thrived for somebody who's much more, more of an introvert in many ways. I, like we could just hang up now. No, <laughs> but it is. And I think with mental health, it's, I mean, this is a time when we're all feeling it. Yeah. You know? And so it's, so if you can reach people in any way, whatever, you know, that will help us, that will help us all. It's a rising tide. Yeah. Very true. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Janet. Yes. I can do my video too. Oh, awesome. It's going to work. Oh. I was, I guess it's not going to come on. That's okay. Um, I was late because my computer is really slow today and we're in the middle of a storm. So, and no day, no um, day um, damage so far, but really close lightning we're having. So, and I'm a strong introvert. <laughs> so I'm not having trouble with COVID. I'm a retired physical therapist and the um, township treasurer. And I was at the class that Blandon put on, you know, a couple of years ago with uh, Barbara. So um, I, you know, I'm not personally affected so much. Our township still meets in person, socially distancing in the town hall. That has been okay. And the 
thing that I get most frustrated about is that people don't understand that if you live in the country, you don't have unlimited access to internet. So someone said, well, we're going to have a Zoom meeting for my book club. And I said, well, I'll call in and she, because, um, you know, I'll run over my minutes. She said, well, I thought Zoom was free. And I think, well, if you have unlimited internet, yes. But if you live in the country, for the last two months now, we've gone over our limit. And if we increase how much we want to take, we can't go back to a lower level again. And hardly anybody who lives in a city understands that, how difficult it is in the country. So I'm just here to be a big supporter of this whole process. And um, I'm really pleased at the pro progress we've made it, uh, you know, made so far. And I'm, I'm really excited this year for the first time in about two years that I think something's actually going to happen with the companies. That I don't know if it'll be the state government or the federal government, but there's going to be enough money to really hook people up. That's what kind of connection do you have? I have something with Verizon called a cantina. They don't make it anymore. It's not really a hot spot, <laughs> but it actually works better than a hot spot. We've had LTD out and they want us to cut down trees in order to do it. We asked somebody west of us to put a, an antenna up in our yard actually, but we're not the highest point in the area. So they wouldn't do that either. <clears throat> And so it's just, um, it's expensive. She's across the ravine from me and I have LTD, but we can't, and I have two neighbors off of mine, but she can't, she's a little bit lower, I think, she's right? Off. We can't quite connect. <laughs> yeah, we, and we just have a lot of, uh, there I am. There you are. We have a lot of woods. We hardly ha ever have to have our air conditioning on as we result. So I, I don't want to, um, cut down trees for internet. No. So we actually have lines coming into the town of Ottawa from Mediacom and they aren't willing to do anything. And Unimin, which is maybe a half a mile south of the town, um, has fiber from CenturyLink who also is not willing to do anything. And Jaguar, so I, I, Jaguar didn't extend along 112 either, did they? Well, they got the whole, no. the whole road and ditch torn up. They, they didn't run fiber or any fiber. No. <laughs> so Is, that's frustrating. Anyway, I'm, just, I'm just a part of this process to make sure things get done. <laughs> well, that's well, no, thank you. Anyway, I can. thank you for being a part of it. I think, I mean, it, it is funny because it's, I, and now the, the thunder is now starting here in St. Paul. It's been right through the whole phone call, but the irony of the troubles that many of you have had getting on, you know, just is, that, that just right. proves the point in so many ways. Yeah, and you can just really see it. Um, even in the past, our neighbors who had kids then in high school couldn't do the kind of uh, research online that they needed to do. That was several years ago. And um, that was before COVID. So it's been a problem for a long time. And I think that COVID has just brought this up. And I just keep passing the information that in rural America, something absolutely needs to be done. I just wanted to add that, um, Anne, that as we've done the, um, our Blandon community building here, it has been all through Zoom. We have 40 to 50 people we have never met face to face, and it's really quite different. And you know a little bit about them, but it, when you call them back or you Zoom back, you don't really have that depth of knowing people. So one of the things that Carl and I have been plotting is maybe a drive through at our winery, 10 people at a time, social distancing, handing out fun t-shirts so people can just wave across Good the idea. and see who you are. Because we haven't had that. And in, it's a very odd way, fragmented way to build community and to have that connectivity when it's just really intermittent uh, connectivity right now, as opposed to really knowing someone. Carl and I were fortunate yesterday to go into the county courthouse and social distance, have a meeting with our county administrator, looking at maps, talking about stuff. It, you, it, it's, there's some, you need some connectivity 
to, and, um, and we need to figure out a way to build that because Carl had not met with Daryl before and having that kind of a meeting really changed the dynamics and builds the trust levels. And so as we go ahead with Bland and we're gonna try to figure out how to have some of that connectivity at a social distance drive-through or have Zoom meetings where you just chat and go into chat rooms. But that's, that's been a myth in our development of our Landon project. Yeah, supporting Barb on that too, Ann. Um, you know, Dr. King, Sue, um, you guys have a remarkable human in Daryl Pettis there. Uh, it was really neat to, to meet him face to face. And um, uh, he's working very intentionally to advance the cause for broadband. And, yep. And um, has really opened up some ideas and thoughts and opportunities that we're pursuing pretty aggressively. So uh, yeah. it was a, a wonderful connect, Barb. Yeah. Well, that's I was I you know we've we've lost Bill, which is unfortunate because I I was going to kind of give him last shout because he's worked with all of me <laughs> and he's worked with so many different communities. But yeah, it. I, and I know many people watching the video will know about the Bland and Broadband communities and some might not know, but um, normally people meet and they meet on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. They, normally they meet in person. I've been to a few of them, you know, I, they're meeting in the, the grade school uh, cafeterias in the basement there. They're meeting in the back of this church. They're meeting in, in all, all the different community places. And you guys really have been the pilot mm -hmm. for moving because it, as you said, we with the one meeting up in Grand Rapids, and then it's been all online. And the, and again, the irony is that there's it, this really is excel, accelerated and exacerbated the need for broadband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's and and, uh, and I can't remember. I, Shannon, maybe it was you who said you don't know what you don't know. Reaching yeah. people who don't have the connectivity, and as you said, there's been a demographic whose interest has been lower. You know, and now all of a sudden they need it. It's well, and just to add to the all the conversation and comments today, one of the things that I thought about on our on our to do list for this COVID is that looking at the county fairgrounds differently. Here we have this place that is underused except for uh, the month of <laughs> August, and it hasn't been used much at all. But the connectivity out there is now what it needs to be. And if you need to have a place to spread people out and you can use those buildings differently, we got to get that, Carl, we got to get that on our list, our to-do list to figure out how to get them hooked up sooner because, it, and Anna, Anna's talked about that too, in terms of emergency response, having a big place where you can gather, you got to have that connectivity so that we got we to gotta get that back up on our list again, hook up with the fairgrounds people. It's a good idea because we just don't know what's going to happen. But having a space, as you yep. said, where you, where you can distance and where you can, that's, I want to give an opportunity for anybody else to kind of chime in based on what you've heard from your, from your colleagues and friends here. I, I was going to add, I, years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine that supervised a bunch of people and, you know, she was saying like a lot of the younger workers kind of, you know, wanted the option to work from home, um, you know, wanted some flexibility in their hours, you know, that's just the way their mindset is yeah. now. And, you know, I, it seemed like back then, you know, a lot of companies were like, no, you know, it's, it's nine to five or eight to four, like, this is what, you know, work day looks like, this is what we do it, we all come in together. And, and I think with the COVID, a lot of companies are realizing we don't have to, you know, be there in person or, um, like Sue said, they had the cubicles, they were all crowded in, you know, and stuff like that. And so I think um, even if you look at it from a cost saving aspect, you know, if, if there's a company or, you know, business or whatever, renting all this office space to, to fit all these people, you know, well, they're going to save money because they don't maybe need as big of a space and the utilities and, and the whatnot. And then, you know, if the workers, that's what they want, you know, is to have the flexible work schedule, you know, they can save money on daycare. Maybe they could work at night if the husband works during the day or whatever. Um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of neat to see where people thought it wasn't possible. They're realizing it is possible. And I think it's going to change the, the workforce, you know, from here on out. And uh, so. I'm just pleased at how many people from the whole county are hanging in there with this. It's just great because I think we're going to get, you know, 
get something done. <laughs> and that's really encouraging. It's slow, but um, thank you to everybody who's hanging in there. And that's a big thank you to, to, to you folks as a group, because I think it's, I'm, I'm always, I think we are, most of us, always looking for a silver lining of COVID, a silver lining of COVID. Let there be some reason for this, you know, and, it's, and it can be hard, but I really do think that rural broadband is one of those silver linings. I think that it, Oh, I agree. Yeah. Also, people um, are learning how to wash their hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people are, you know, the, we're fairly spoiled as a nation. I, I've gone to Haiti a lot, and um, we just don't know how to deal with these things where other people have to deal with them on a daily basis. So uh, I think there's quite a few good things that, that will come out of this, and broadband will be one of them, thankfully. Yes, I think so. I think so. I'll give folks um, kind of a an opportunity to say something last, especially if you can think of another, you know, another example in the way of what you'll carry forward with broadband, how, how broadband is being a, a silver lining. Not just getting, not, not just the getting of the broadband, but how will it make your lives different moving forward? Well, I would just say in connectivity, if we didn't have broadband and we were going through this, uh, think think of what we would um, we would not be accomplishing very much, and it would be quite a hardship. You know, it is a struggle, but like you said, it's a silver lining with the fact that we have also resources um, dedicated to this. But I I don't know how we would do what. And the fact that I don't get any, I get zero complaints on a finance big bucket of uh, financial assistance and. Uh, communication and that says something right there yeah. people are to some degree you know it's not perfect but nothing is perfect and people are getting their needs met um, and the and the different things that we've been able to pull off just thinking of social media and the food distribution that Anne has coordinated those big events it's just amazing what has been able to be accomplished through technology so it's uh, it is a good thing that's for sure it is. Well, we should close because we have another Zoom meeting, some of us oh, at noon. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Again, the irony. That's, thank you. Thank you all so much for your time. As I said, I'll have this up in the next couple of days, and then it'll be part of the your county broadband profile um, in the fall. So I, I thank you for keeping on. Thanks. Well, and let me just add quick that Anne, Anne, I said, share this with the county board that Anne does those, those um, profiles each year. And last year she made a new category for us because she saw real hope in our county moving ahead. <laughs> that was so fun. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Looking at, as I said, looking at 87 counties, you use some people get to a certain point and they get complacent. And then you see some people and you're like, yep, they're going to leapfrog. Yeah, I don't. I'm not very sports ball oriented, but I'm like, if I was a gambling woman. Well, and in fact, um, I was on a on a blended call Tuesday morning looking at the speed testing, and the the speed testing guy said, "What?" It's, I brought up Lisa County that we were working on. He said, "I noticed Lisa County is just blowing up in terms of speed testing." I was wondering why, <laughs> and I said, "Well, we're out there. We're going to get a thousand at least." <laughs> you guys are hopping you guys are full bed broadband soon so thank enjoy you, your Anne. next zoom call thank you thank you so much for your time and thank you thank yep. you bye-bye bye thank you